Luke 23, starting in verse 50. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, the city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Today we are going to read, we are going to go through the burial of Jesus Christ, which is mentioned in all four Gospels. Why is this important? It's important because for one more time, the Gospel writers are stressing the fact that Jesus actually died. Jesus really, truly died. For the past three weeks, as we've been looking at our text, we've been talking about the importance and the implications of Jesus' death. And so one more time, before we go through our text, let me just make some important observations about the death of Christ, because this is one, this is one of the most important things ever. First of all, Jesus' death means that he was a real human being. First of all, you may say, well, we know that. Uh, this is important. Jesus was not a phantom. Jesus was not a demigod. Jesus was a true, real human being. One of the earliest heresies in church history, one of the earliest heresies uh, in connection to Christianity, was that Jesus was not a real man. Today's heresies will say that Jesus isn't really God. They'll say, yeah, he's a, he was a man, but he wasn't really God. The earliest heresies said, no, he is God, but he's not a real man. How can God be a real man? And, uh, of course, John in his second epistle says, if anyone says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, he is an antichrist. So, it is highly important to believe in both the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was not 100% truly man, then he can't be your substitute. Why is it that bulls and goats can't take away sin? Because we're human beings, and we need a human being to be our substitute. And Jesus Christ became a real, true human being. So that's one lesson from the fact that Jesus truly died. Second of all, as we know, as we've been talking about for the past three weeks, if Jesus didn't die, your sins have not been paid for. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus died as your substitute. If he didn't really die, your sins have not been paid for. If Jesus did not die, that means that you have to pay for your sins. Okay? Highly important. And thirdly, if Jesus didn't die, then he wasn't resurrected. Right? You can only be resurrected if you die. And if Jesus was not resurrected, well then there is no Christianity. <laughs> that is the center of Christianity. We are wasting our time in being here. And uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 said, If Christ is not risen, then your faith is pointless, our preaching is pointless, and we should be the most miserable people in the world. But Jesus did die. And we're going to get into this more when we get into chapter 24, when Jesus rises from the dead. Uh, but, back to our text. Uh, Jesus died and he was buried um, let's get into the context. If you recall, around 9 o'clock in the morning, Jesus was crucified. Approximately around 9 o'clock in the morning. He was crucified along with two other men. 
he was on the cross for six hours. Around three o'clock in the afternoon, he died. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died around three o'clock. Uh, and then we saw the reactions of the people to Jesus' death. Now, before we go through our text in Luke, because as you know, all four Gospels talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because this is the climax of all four Gospels, they all give us a lot of information and a lot of details about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And because there's so many details, everyone, uh, everyone who doesn't want to believe in the Bible, they try and find contradictions between the four Gospels. And there are no contradictions, it is all complementary, but sometimes it's difficult to put everything together because of all the information. But I'm going to attempt that. <laughs> Um, before we look at our text, there's a lot of stuff that is going on, especially that we read in John, but from the other Gospels also. So let me give you a quick background of what was going on that Luke does not record, so we can understand Luke better. So, Jesus dies around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Jews, around the same time that Jesus died have gone to Pilate, John tells us this, they've gone to Pilate, and they ask that the bodies be taken down off the cross. Now, not alive, <laughs> no one comes off a cross alive, okay? When you get someone off the cross, the cross is execution, it's not just torture. Uh, they, they ask that the, the, the three men on the crosses be killed so that they can be brought down off the cross, so that they don't spend the night on the cross. Why? I'll tell you why. Back in Deuteronomy 2021, 20, I think. You don't have to go there. Back in Deuteronomy 21, it says this. If a man has committed a sin deserving, deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he, who is hanged on, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. And so you had the scripture that said that if anyone is hung on a tree, he, is not, he shouldn't stay overnight. And so the Jews said, okay, well this is a piece of wood that the people are hanging from. And so they did not want people hanging on the cross overnight. They wanted them to die on that day so that they could bury them, because they didn't want to defile the land. Of course, they didn't have a problem killing the Messiah, but they didn't want to defile the land. And so they go to Pilate and they say, can we have their legs broken so that we can bury them? Now, why would we want to have their legs broken? We talked about this a few weeks ago when Jesus was crucified. If you remember, I'll, I'll give you a quick run through. When someone is crucified, how do they die? They're dying, well partly, uh, it could be from blood loss, but the main reason they would die is because the way that the body is hanging there, they can't breathe. It's very difficult to breathe. And in order to breathe, they would have to push up on their legs on the nail that is through the legs. They'd have to push up on, the, on their legs to be able to take a breath and then hang back down again. Okay, and then push back up, take a deep breath, and fall back down again. It was continual movement. And so, if you break a crucified person's legs, he can't push up anymore, and therefore he cannot breathe, and therefore he dies quickly. What they would do, don't want to get too graphic here, but what they would do is they would, the Roman soldiers would take big, huge sledgehammers, smash the guy's legs. And if they didn't die from the shock of having their legs crushed, um, they couldn't pu push up anymore and they died pretty quick. So, having said that, Around 3 o'clock, around the time that Jesus is dying, the Jews have gone to Pilate, they say, can we have their legs broken because we want, we want them down off the cross before sundown. Pilate says, okay, go. And so, 
on their way, they're, they're on their way to go have, to have the legs broken. At the same time, I'm trying to put everything together, at the same time, Jesus has died. And Joseph of Arimathea, that we will read about in our text today, he at that time is going to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. Because ordinarily, what would happen with a criminal who is hanging on a cross, the Romans, if he died, the Romans would just take him down, like throw him in a pit. What do they care? It's a criminal. And so Joseph of Arimathea, he doesn't want Jesus' body to just be tossed into a pit or something. So as soon as Jesus dies, he runs to Pilate to ask for the body so that he can bury it. And Mark tells us that as soon as he gets there, Pilate is surprised that Jesus is dead already. Because the Jews were just there asking for the people to be killed, but Jesus had already died. And Pilate is, he's dead already? He's only been on the cross for six hours. Sometimes people, it would take them days to die on the cross. And so, um, and so he was surprised that Jesus was already dead. And so he, he called for the centurion. The centurion said, yes, he's dead. So he, he allowed Joseph to take the body. Now, as... <laughs> these are all going on at the same time. As Joseph is asking for the body, back at Calvary, the soldiers are ready to, to break the, the guy's legs. So they go to the first guy, break his legs. They go to the second guy, break his legs. They go to Jesus... Jesus isn't moving. He's already dead. There's no point in breaking his legs. But, just to make sure that he's dead, get a spear, boom, into the side, and blood and water came out, proving that he was actually dead. They didn't break Jesus' legs, because he was already dead. Now, so Jesus is dead, and they want to get him off the cross, and buried before 6 p.m. Because at 6 p.m. the Sabbath begins, right? And that's when the evening begins, 6 o'clock. And so he, Jesus dies around 3. It's 3.30, 4, when, when Joseph asks for the body. So now you have like two hours left in which they need to bury Jesus' body really quick. So, let's look at our text in Luke. Verse 50 starts off by saying, Behold! So this is something, he's saying, look, this is something astounding. This is something amazing. Behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned in all four Gospels that he buried Christ. He is never mentioned before and he is never mentioned again. He is only mentioned right here. But he is so important that all four Gospels mention him. Uh, what do we know about this man? First of all, in verse 50, he says he was a council member. A council member. That's the member of the Sanhedrin. This, the same high court high supreme court that had Jesus killed, he was part of that group. Uh, Mark tells us that he was a well-known and well-respected council, uh, council member. Uh, and Matthew tells us that he was rich. Rich man. Which may be the reason he was respected so much. Uh, Luke simply tells us that he was a good and just man who had not consented to their decision. They had decided to have Jesus killed. He did not agree to that. Now, was he there when they came to their verdict and they said, we need to kill him for blasphemy? Was he, was he not there? Was he there and said no and they ignored him? I don't know. But he was against Jesus being killed. Uh, we are told that he was from Arimathea, city of the Jews. We don't know exactly where that is. And it says that he waited for the kingdom of God. Earlier, much earlier in the Gospel of Luke, I think it was back in chapter 2, when it talks about Simeon and Anna, it says that they were two people who waited for the kingdom of God. It's, it's another way of saying that they were believers. They were of the remnant of Israel. But most importantly, 
something that Luke doesn't tell us, that John does. John says that he was a secret disciple. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ, but in secret because he feared the Jews. Now, the Bible does not speak very favorably of people who keep their faith secret. As Christians, we are to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 10, it says that we are to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is the whole point of baptism. The whole point of baptism is confessing your faith in Christ. I believe and I'm openly declaring my uh, allegiance and my connection to Christ. And so you get baptized. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 10 said, If you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. So it is very important for people to confess their faith in Christ. And so, you know, a lot of people will say, I'll believe in Jesus in my heart, but I won't tell anyone. And they'll point to Joseph of Arimathea. And they'll say, look, here's a guy who was a secret disciple. So I can be a secret disciple. But here's the thing. Joseph of Arimathea did not remain a secret disciple. He was for a while, but if something is in your heart, it's going to come out. He couldn't remain silent and secret forever. And so at this point, he shows that he is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so that's why in verse 42, uh, sorry, sorry, 52, it says, This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. In Mark, we are told that he boldly went and asked for the body of Jesus. I want you to think about this, because this is, this is important. Where were all the other disciples of Jesus at this point? Hiding somewhere. They had been openly disciples of Jesus for three and a half years. Now Jesus is killed and they're all hiding for their lives. And this man, who was secret for three and a half years, he comes out in the open now. Do you realize what this would cost him? I, th I want you if, you, if you don't get anything else from today, I want you to get this. Do you realize what it would cost this man to do what he did? In John chapter 9 and John chapter 12, we're told that if anyone confessed Christ, the Jews would kick them out of the synagogue. Excommunicate them. Now, to us, excommunication may seem like, ah, no big deal. So many people, most people don't go to church. If they were kicked out of one church, they'd say, who cares, I'll go find a different church. That's not how it worked. This was a highly religious society. If you were part of the society, you were part of the synagogue. If you were kicked out of the synagogue, that basically meant that they consider you to be a pagan. We do not consider you to be a believer. You're a pagan and we kick you out. You would be a social outcast. Your family may want nothing to do with you. Your friends may want nothing to do with you. You may not even be able to buy and sell things because we consider you to be a heathen. Not to mention the fact that this guy was a member of the Sanhedrin. He had status. He had privileges. He had money. And he says, doesn't matter. I'm going to go and the whole world is going to know that I'm on Jesus' side now. Would you be willing to do that? If everyone around you was against Jesus, would you confess Christ? Or would you say, well, I'll believe in my heart, but I won't say anything because I don't want to get into trouble. What would you do? He says, I've been secret for far too long, and I'm not going to allow for my Lord to be thrown into a pit or left on the cross to rot and be eaten by birds, so I am going to give him a proper burial. That's what Joseph of Arimathea did. And so he goes to Pilate and asks for the body. As we said in Mark, Pilate is uh, surprised that Jesus is already dead. He calls the centurion. He says, is he really dead? He says, yes. 
He allows him to take the body. Verse 53 says, Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. Jesus, uh, Joseph takes the, the body off the cross, which, by the way, would have made him ceremonially unclean. The Jews, this is, this is during the Passover, and everyone wants to, to be able to, to uh, keep the Passover. And that's why they wanted the people off the crosses, so that no one would get defiled. Uh, Joseph doesn't care. He is getting the body off the cross, which would defile him, because you weren't allowed to touch a dead body. But he doesn't care. And he goes to bury him. If you recall in the Gospel of John, he was not alone in doing this. He wasn't the only one burying Jesus. There was another man. Who was it? Nicodemus. 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 Who's the, Nicodemus is not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. He's not in the synoptics. Uh, John is the only one who mentions Nicodemus. He mentions him a few times through the gospel. And he's a guy, he seems like he's a guy who's kind of struggling whether he should or shouldn't believe in Jesus. He's having some trouble. But at the end here, Nicodemus shows up. And he brings a bunch of spices to, for the body of Jesus. And he, together with Joseph of Arimathea, uh, buried, buried Jesus. Uh, we're told here that they wrapped his body in linen. That's not one big sheet. It's not one big sheet that they just put around your body. It's strips. And they would put them around like this. Around the arms, around the legs. Around, it was like, like a mummy. Okay, so you're not tied up like this. It's around like this. And they would take the spices and put them in under the linen so that, you know, you could disguise the smell of a decaying body. That, that, that's, that's how they buried people. And so, Joseph and Nicodemus buried Jesus. And they put him, it says, in a tomb. They put him in a tomb, which was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever been lain before. Matthew tells us that this tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. It was his own tomb, whether he was going to bury himself or his family or whatever, but it belonged to Joseph. And um, so they take him and they put Jesus in this new tomb that was cut out from a rock. And then we're told that they put a big stone in front of the entrance. So, Jesus is dead and he is buried in a rich man's tomb, which is a fulfillment of, who knows, Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, that great passage where it talks about Christ dying for our sins, he was pierced for our transgressions, the iniquity that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. It then says that Jesus was uh, his grave was made with wicked people because he was killed alongside criminals but also his grave was made with a rich man so even though he was killed alongside with wicked people he was buried in the tomb of a rich man little did Joseph of Arimathea know that when he buried Jesus in his own tomb he was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah from 700 years earlier so Jesus is dead and buried. Verse 54. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. The Sabbath was going to begin at 6 o'clock that afternoon. Uh, the previous day before the Sabbath is called the preparation day because you're not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath. And so if you wanted to eat or do anything on the Sabbath, you had to prepare it the previous day. So the previous day is called the preparation because, you know, you want to keep the fourth commandment, which says, keep the Sabbath holy. So, verse 55, And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So Joseph and Nicodemus bury him, and all the women were following along behind, because they wanted to see where he was going to be buried. Where he was going to be buried. Why? Well, Remember, the whole, the whole death of Christ was so quick. Everything happened in just a few hours. And so, his acquaintances, and like these women who are his followers, 
They didn't have time to do anything. They didn't have the time or the money to prepare anything. Joseph and Nicodemus, who are rich, if, you, if you're rich, you can get a lot of stuff done quick. But, and so they, they were able to get the tomb, get the spices, and bury him. But these women, they, didn't, they hadn't prepared anything. So they see where Jesus is laid so that they can go home and get more spices and more fragrances and stuff like that and, and go back and do it more properly. You know. Okay? Verse 56 says, Then they, that's the women, they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So it's the end of the preparation day. They can't go the next day because it's the Sabbath and they have to rest. So they go and they gather spices and they prepare to go on Sunday morning. Let me say this and I'll close. You can see the love that the women had for Christ and that they wanted to give him a proper burial. But, even though we can see their love, we don't really see faith. Because Jesus had specifically said, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to be raised from the dead. But did they believe this? No. And so they go and they waste their time, and they waste their efforts, because all of this, all these spices and fragrances are not going to be used. And they're going to waste them, because when they get there, He's not there. That'll be good. We'll see that next week.